on that so that uh, we can engage more on the subject from the rest of the, the, the panelists. Uh, Gabila, uh, let's ride on uh, with you, uh, Mr. Elijah uh, Inoko, listening uh, to the, the analysis of Professor Gabila. Actually, uh, uh, we want to continue uh, with this other aspect. We are talking about uh, uh, another area, which is investment of foreign direct investment in Africa, another positive aspect of uh, geopolitics. Now, the question I am asking, because the end at the end of, of this uh, debate session we ensure uh, that of course uh, the discussions will go a long way uh, to affect even the decisions uh, making uh, uh, bodies in uh, across africa so as to maximize the advantages uh, which we have seen a uh, colossal uh, advantages of uh, uh, geopolitical engagement of all of course or the engagement of many uh, global powers in Africa. So now, uh, uh, Mr. Elijah Enoko, let's look at the uh, uh, how ready African stakeholders are to actually uh, grasp the advantages uh, that will come with this investment and diversification of that we're actually asking for as far as uh, this uh, uh, international cooperation is gaining grounds. Huh? Because when we look at it critically, we also want to analyze data availability. Are, are we uh, actually provided with the right data that we can see areas that uh, necessitate, uh, that can necessitate necessitate a diversification or how uh, are these uh, young people because when they talk about human capital development we want to focus more on uh, the vibrant young African population and how ready uh, aware or conversant are there with the changing dynamics and how ready are there to grasp these opportunities uh, that come as a result of uh, the geopolitical engagement or a hike in international relations between African states and other uh, world powers? That is a very important question and that question will help us have a discussion about the real issues that we want to talk about geopolitical influence on the continent of africa i want to make sure that we come back to what we the core issue is geopolitical influence on the continent of africa and the question now ties in into how is africa now benefiting on of, on that influence or is africa actually benefiting because if you look at it uh Chris and my colleagues on the planet if you look at how geopolitics is playing on the continent of Africa and the influence that they're having, there are strategic areas that Africa needs to take advantage of. And geopolitics is what Africa has not really mastered so well. You asked a question before. Let's look at the resource, you know, the resources of the on the continent of Africa, because that is an area where we see geopolitics playing in the light in Africa. The resources of the of the of, on the continent of Africa. We see competing global powers, you know, regional actors that are backing different governments in Africa because of their own interest, and we see that that has led to long and prolonged conflicts on the continent of Africa. That's you know disrupting economic growth. The question is, how are the young people going to take advantage of the resources that exist in their countries? When you have geopolitical powers, geopolitical players that are coming in, backing rebel leaders, backing different people, and creating conflict, that has become like what they call in the continent of Africa a cliche, uh, a resource curse. It's now becoming like a resource curse. You find a continent in Africa where resources have been discovered, gold has been discovered, oil and gas has been discovered. It doesn't take long that you're going to see a conflict emanating on the continent of Africa in that particular region. Why is it that? Geopolitics, geopolitical players coming to Africa, breeding conflict on the continent of Africa because they want to exploit resources. How will, why, why does Africa allow itself to be played around by these foreign powers? That's the question we should be asking ourselves. Because if you look about, you know, capital allocation, like you, like you asked, or foreign investment and partnership, we've seen that geopolitical players, when they come into Africa, they have a preference for one country to the other. They don't come as 
money all over Africa, or they don't come and engage just globally all over Africa like that. They go strategically. They go to countries that are resource rich, and they have a reason why they're doing that. Is the reason of, of the interest of Africa or their own interest. That's what we should be looking at. Because if you talk about human development, if you look at the United Nations Development Index, you look at the poorest countries in Africa, and you look at what is driving that poverty, you'll be shocked about the foreign actors that are acting in that same country. We can take case studies on a corridor there. You are in Cameroon. You look at democratic, I mean, uh, 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 Central African Republic. You look at the war that is going on there, please. Let's, let's speak reality and look about things that are happening on the ground. Look at the war that is going on in, uh, in, in, in CRA. Look at the political actors that are acting in that continent. Look at how they are backing one rebel leader against the other on the continent of Africa, and we're allowing that to happen. Because if we do not understand how this geopolitical influence is happening on the continent of Africa, we can come out with lofty ideals or how we can take advantage of this and this, but if we do not understand how they're coming through the back door to ruin us, we will not stop the siphoning of resources of Africa. We will not do that. If you look at you know, my my colleague uh, Professor Gabila, uh, Nobila talk about you know engaging with uh, uh, international uh, donors, which is a noble idea, great, but how does Africa engage with them? When you have the Britain Wood institutions that are giving loans to the continent of Africa at ten mm -hmm. to sixteen percent. And then they're giving to Western powers at 0.5. If you look at the credit ratings of Canada and the United States, for example, they are on A++. But these geopolitical actors will go to Africa, cause chaos in Africa, cause war in Africa, and then at the end of the day, make Africa as C-. minus. When they reach as C-, minus, and you go to get money, you are going to get it at 10 to 16% interest rate. How do you expect these countries to develop when they are borrowing at those exorbitant rates and then the Western world is borrowing at 0.0, 0.1%? That is the geopolitics we are talking about here, Clarice, because if you want to engage with Africa with clean hands, they say he who comes to the table comes with, uh, with clean hands. If you want to engage Africa with, on a equal basis with clean hands, you must make sure that Africa is acting on a playing level field. If you disadvantage Africa, it doesn't matter that you're talking about World Bank loans, Britain Wood Institution loans, IMF loans, and so on, but you are already disadvantaged. Africa is already working, uh, engaging with those partners as a disadvantaged rate. How do you expect Africa to, 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 to have a leg forward? Not only that, the whole world is talking about global, you know, environmental impact and so on and so forth. Look at the impact of geopolitics, even from an environmental perspective on the continent of Africa. We see, you know, uh, in Nigeria, there was, I think, almost 100 and something people died from a dam that collapsed. In Mozambique, people are dying of drought and so on. In all these countries, look at what the global political strategy, uh, uh, strategies are doing on the continent of Africa. The recent World uh, Environment Forum that took place, when Africa was asking for money, in order to do mitigation or adaptation. What did they say? These are the people that are causing the problem in the world, but they go around trying to strategize their interests without looking at the common good of Africa. That's what Africa needs to look at. Are we ready to engage these people and call them out when they're causing chaos in Africa? My colleague talked about infrastructure development in Africa. That's great. You know, building of roads and railways and ports and all this to enhance connectivity and growth within the continent of Africa, but it raises concerns of environmental issues that these people cause in Africa. If you go to Nigeria, for example, give an example. If you see the chaos, the chaos that have been caused by Shell and all these other uh, 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 geopolitical partners that have decimated the whole of the Ogoni land. And when activists rise up, like Ken Serwewa and they want to speak, what happens? They are killed. So we must call a spade a spade on what is happening in Africa. These geopolitical powers do not come to Africa with good intentions. They come to Africa because they want to engage in Africa for their own benefits. Africa must be able to stand up and say enough is enough. This geopolitical rivalry that's happening on the continent of Africa, it must happen to the advantage of Africa. 
let my colleague already mentioned, Africa must take advantage of the technology, economy. You know, you mentioned about the free trade uh, area in Africa. If you read uh, Business Insider, you see the commotion that happened in the Western Hemisphere when this was announced. That tells you that these people are afraid of the African free trade zone because everybody was, you know, there's commotion. What does it mean? When Africa comes out with the African free trade zone, does it mean that, you know, the United States is going to cancel all its engagement with Nigeria, South Africa, Cameroon, Congo, Kinshasa? Are we going to be dealing with one single African body right now? What about our trade agreements and so on? China was asking the same question. Russia was asking the same question. That tells you that these people come to Africa without good intention. And Africa must stand up and say, hey, this is a time that one engage at partners. This is what we are bringing to the table. And if you look at, you know, whether you're talking about technology or whatever part you're talking about, all the resources, you know, there was a discussion that we had on African skills. And I mentioned, if you look at the natural resources that are going to propel the world in the next century and the next dispensation, Africa has more than 40% of those resources. Whether you talk about, the, I mean, uh, metals that we need to use for cell phones, uh, electric cars, whatever, you can name them. Africa has what it takes to drive the world. But is Africa benefiting from those resources? That is what we need to look at. And that's why African leaders who are listening to us need to take note and make sure that the continent of Africa does not become a geopolitical football that they are now playing left and right like they did in 1884. Africa needs to become a partner on the table. Mr. Elager uh, Enoko, listening to you critically, uh, we, we, we begin to say is that, of course, uh, this debate is actually uh, meeting the objective of uh, uh, enlightening the African stakeholders, enlightening everybody to, to understand uh, how geopolitics function and how Africa being a major player uh, among these uh, global world pairs can take advantage of the dynamics across Africa in the contemporary society to change, of course, narratives in every sphere, be it economy, politics, social, like we already uh, mentioned, uh, and I uh, will uh, tell, uh, confirm uh, with you that uh, uh, the uh, for advocates of Pan-Africanism actually uh, uh, talked about Africa as one entity and of course uh, seeing the advantages that Africa can actually get if they trade as one body.